sing about the blood of Jesus. to worship here at St. Andrew Baptist Church. If you're joining us online, glad you're with us. Please join in and sing. You know, there's nothing really, I think, that prepares our heart, our heart for worship like rejoicing with one another. In Psalms 122, 1, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Listen, we're, we're supposed to come and worship together and that means that some of us like me may not sound good when we do it but it doesn't matter <laughs> doesn't matter a bit what matters is your heart attitude as you come to worship so let's let's pray right now that God God would prepare our hearts father lord we love you there is no one like you and that's that's why we've come to worship this morning father we rejoice because we have an opportunity to gather together to worship you. Lord, I pray right now, would you prepare our hearts for worship? Father, would you just help us to put aside all those cares and concerns from last week, all the things that troubled us, the things that might be looming on the horizon. Father, push those aside so that we can gaze on you Father, that we might see you and you alone, not, Father, for what you might give us, but for who you are. You are our Lord and Savior, and we've come to worship you this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's sing out about this great, amazing love of God for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Chapter 51, the psalmist asked the Lord for a pure heart and a renewed spirit. Let's let that be our prayer as we sing Revive Us Again.
praise team, Brother Doug was out for an important extended family event. So uh, members of the praise team, thank you for the way that you led us and choir, leading us in worship. And it's good to see you today. I know we have some folks who have uh, returned to worshiping with us by way of online services with things that are that are happening uh, in our, our country. Looks like uh, these things are just not going to turn out to be very predictable to us, so we just have to uh, navigate as the Lord leads us to do so. And let me, let me say to you, that's what we want you to do here. If you uh, want to wear a mask, wear one. That's, that's all right, you know. Uh, if, if you prefer to fist bump instead of shake, well, then when you reach out your hand, just have it closed. We'll know you're not going to punch us. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll just know you'd rather, rather greet by, by fist bump. So just, just do, you know, what you're comfortable with, what you think is best. Uh, but uh, hope that, that many of us will be able to continue to gather in worship there is a dimension of our worshiping together in person that can't be duplicated online. I'm glad that we're able to have online services uh, for those that cannot come. But for those that are able, uh, there is an important dimension to us coming together to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. So glad to, glad to see you. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we began looking at the Sermon on the Mount and uh, can't begin to do a, a whole series on that and to still move through the Gospels. Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes where he plainly described what this new life in him was going to be like, to give people a picture of the kind of transformed, saved life that he offered through faith in himself. And then he, he went on to, to begin to teach about other, all the dimensions of that life. And, and don't you know the people that were sitting on that mountainside listening to this teacher who had come out of Nazareth wondered about this new prophet who had come on the scene. But understand that at that point, they did not know that he was the prophet whom God said he would send after Moses. They did not recognize that here before them teaching was the Messiah himself who would go to a cross and pay the penalty for their sin. During this long and very comprehensive teaching, Jesus taught people how to pray. And we looked at what that says to us about prayer and how we are to be engaged in the discipline of praying as Jesus was since childhood. Now this morning, I want to cut to the very end of Jesus' message. And in Matthew chapter 7, where the Sermon on the Mount comes to a conclusion, most Bibles, in order to help us read, they, they don't just continue with unbroken text as it was in the originals, but they put in subject headers to help us follow what the particular passages are talking about. And so most Bibles break this last part of the sermon into four distinctive parts. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just an attempt to aid us in following the, the flow of what's being presented. And in all honesty, I have preached sermons on each of those four parts of the end of the Sermon on the Mount separately, at different, at different times, not particularly relating one to the other. But as I was reading through the Gospel of, of Matthew, and what I'm doing as I preach this sermon to you is I'm, I'm reading again through the Gospels and the life of Christ, just asking the Spirit to, to tell me where to stop and to, to pause and to do a message on this particular thing. 
And so I was, was moving through the rest of the Sermon on the, the Mount here in Matthew and, and other places where parts of it are mentioned in, in the other Gospels when the Lord just kind of paused me on this passage. And I saw that in these four parts of this ending to the Sermon on the Mount, there is a strong thread woven through each of the parts that binds them all together. And it is an important thread to see all four of these parts as a whole. There is a message here that Jesus is calling to our attention. And frankly, he is acknowledging that among those who would one day identify as a follower of Christ. See, this is at the beginning of his ministry, so, so only a few now have really committed themselves to it. But he's, he's acknowledging that as people do this, and as people self-identify and say, I'm following Jesus, I'm a Christian, that there will be those who are real, who are genuine disciples of the Lord Jesus, but that there will be others who will say, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, but they don't. They are fake. And Jesus is speaking about that here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So it's important for us to consider what Jesus says about real and fake followers. And it's important for two reasons. One is so that we do not fool ourselves. We do that about things sometimes, don't we? We fool ourselves. We talk ourselves into, into things. And certainly concerning our eternal destiny, concerning our eternal relationship with God, we don't want to be fooling ourselves about the truth. But secondly, we don't want to be fooled by others either. We do not want to be led astray by those who say at least some of the right words, but who are not real, who are not genuine. So understanding that Jesus is addressing this dichotomy that's a reality, now certainly a reality in our world, and we see it all the time. Let's read the first part of this passage. <coughs> Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few that find it. Now Jesus says there's really only two types of people. There's those that are headed for destruction which is a reference to hell and to ultimately the lake of fire. And there are those who are on the path to eternal life to live with their Lord forever. That's it. Everybody fits in one of those two categories. Those headed for destruction are those on the path to eternal life. Let's talk about those on the path to life everlasting first. Jesus said the gate to this path is narrow. In fact, many others have, have said quite properly so that the gate to this path is only one man wide. They're right. Jesus said, I 
am the door. I am the door. It's one man wide. He said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said, I'm that gate. I'm that door. I am the way to the narrow path that leads to life everlasting. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, my friend, if we will just think about how the Bible says a person receives eternal life, how a person is able to live with God forever and ever, it will be clear to us we will not have any doubt about the fact that there is only one way to enter into the path that leads to everlasting life, and that is through Jesus. Because the very reason that all of us fear or should fear eternal uh, uh, damnation in hell is because we are all sinners. If God gives any of us what we deserve, we will be alienated from him forever because sin separates us from holy God. And it is true in every single one of our lives, in the life of every person that's ever been born without exception. So the only way for someone to go to heaven is for that problem, that sin problem, that condemnation problem to be dealt with. And that is what Jesus did when he left glory and he came down to this earth. He came not merely to, to teach or to show the way he did that, but he came to pay the penalty for sin once and for all for those who were willing to allow his death to be the payment for their sin. And so he allowed mere men. I mean, he, he said, look, there's, a, a, there's legions of angels ready to come rescue me from the cross. <laughs> Don't think you can put me in a jail. Don't think you can hold me to the post while I'm whipped. Don't think those nails could keep me on the cross. No. He came for this purpose. It was the reason why he came to earth. That he could hang up on that cross and die a cruel and awful death. Paying the penalty for our sin once and for all. God, in, in a great, horrid miracle, gathered all the sin across time of every man and woman that's ever lived and put that sin upon the Lord Jesus. And that's why Jesus cried out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time since eternity passed, the fellowship between father and son was broken as all the sin of the world was heaped upon Christ. Jesus shed his blood and died to pay the penalty for each and every one of our sins. And it is only by that sacrifice of his life in our place that salvation can be offered to those who will turn to him in faith and put their trust in him as Lord and as Savior. And you see, when you understand that that's what God did, that's what Jesus, the Son of God, did, to make salvation available, then it is easy to understand why the path to eternal life is only one man wide. <laughs> why it's only through Jesus. I mean, I mean, who else even claims to have ever done that? Of all the religious figures of the world that there have ever been, there's never been one about whom it's been said, he died to pay for my sins except Jesus. He's the only one. And that's why it is only through faith in him 
that we enter into the path that leads to eternal life. You know, as it says in, in Romans, one of my favorite verses, because it so succinctly tells us how to be saved and how to know that we will live with God forever. If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So we believe this truth that I've just explained. We believe this gospel in our heart. But then we act upon that by putting our trust in Jesus, not only as our Savior, but as our Lord. That means master. We surrender control of our life to him. So that only those who have trusted Jesus as Lord are saved. That's all. Now, you may be thinking that this is mighty, narrow-minded thinking that Jesus would be the only way of salvation. And you're right. You're right. It is narrow-minded thinking. But it was Jesus who said the gate and the path. Are narrow. <laughs> They're narrow. It is the only way. It is an exclusive way. It is open to everyone. The invitation to come and to enter through the gate of the Lord Jesus Christ is open to everyone. But anyone who is saved must enter by that gate. And Jesus said, and it's a difficult road to walk on. The path is narrow, and it's difficult. And friend, it's not always easy. It's certainly not always convenient to obey Christ, is it? Those of you that are on the road, isn't that true? Not always easy. Not always the convenient thing to do. And those who walk that road of obedience, who say Jesus is my Lord, and who live their lives under his control, walking with him are often ridiculed or even rejected. But so was he. <laughs> so was he. So if we're going to be followers of Christ, would we not expect the same? And if we are true followers of Christ, we will receive the same. So let me ask you, have you entered? Have you entered through the gate of Jesus Christ by inviting him to be the Lord, the master of your life, surrendering control of your life to him? Is he Lord over you? If not, you can do that today. Before we end in this place, I'm going to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus to become the Lord of your life, to say to the Father, I believe this gospel. I believe it in my heart, and now I want Jesus to become the Lord, the master of my life, and I surrender control. Today, I want to enter by the gate. Let's talk for a moment about the other type of person. Jesus said there's only two. There's those who, are, who enter by the, the narrow gate and walk the narrow path that leads to life. But there are those headed for destruction. And this is a sad, sad conversation. I do not enjoy talking about this at all. But it's needful. It is needful because especially in our positive thinking, all affirmation culture. I mean, don't you dare say a negative word, you know. Don't, 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 you, don't you do anything that's not affirming. You know, that's the culture in which we live. And, and in that kind of culture, there are many who do not think of themselves 
as walking down the path of destruction that leads to everlasting separation from God and to, to hell and ultimately the lake of fire. They never think about themselves in, that, in those terms, but in reality, they are speeding along as fast as they can go on the highway to hell. Oblivious. Just oblivious to what's going to happen when they step into eternity. Who are they? Who are those that are headed for destruction? Well, in a general way, we can, we can say it's anyone who is of an age of understanding who's gotten old enough to understand right from wrong and has the capability of understanding the, the gospel and understanding a choice that needs to be made. Anyone who comes to that age of understanding who has not yet trusted Jesus as their Lord, they are the ones who are headed for destruction. But so that we be clear, let us be a little more specific. This includes, of course, all atheists and agnostics. You certainly cannot believe the gospel that Jesus, the Son of God, came and died for our sins and rose from the dead and offers eternal life to those who trust. You can't believe that if you don't believe in God. And even if you take the agnostic position to say, well, I just don't know whether there's a God or not. I'm telling you, you just cannot trust in Christ until you believe there's a God. So every atheist, every agnostic, while they cling to that belief, walks this path headed for destruction. And certainly all who worship another God whether that be Buddha or Allah or the pantheon of Hinduism or any other God by any other name, listen, God is not called by the names of false gods. He does not accept that. He does not respond to worship offered to them. He does not respect devotion shown to them. There is one him alone shall we serve. And those who worship Yahweh are Jehovah, the one true creator God, but who have not trusted Messiah Jesus, the Son of God. They worship Yahweh but they had not trusted in his son whom Yahweh sent to die on the cross for our sins, they too are on the path headed for destruction. That includes all Jews who have not yet accepted Jesus. But it includes also many, many, many non-Jews. I mean, how many people do you know who say, well, I believe there's a God. You know, I believe there's a God. But they have not put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. I will tell you it includes even those who believe in the historical Jesus. Who, who believe the, the facts, many of the facts the Bible lays out concerning the fact that he died on a cross. They even may believe in the resurrection. But even thinking that those things are true in their mind, they still depend upon their own merits to get them into heaven. And, and they think, you know, ultimately God's going to put them in the balance and he's going to, to weigh them not against Jesus and not against his standard, but he's going to weigh them against the really bad folks they read about in the paper or they see spotlighted on TV. And they say, well, I'm, I'm better than they are. They may even think they're better than average. And, and they think God's going to scoop off the top layer. And surely they're going to be in that layer. 
and take them to heaven. And God says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Some have not trusted Jesus and they depend on their good works. I love people. I always try to do the kind thing. So sure, God's going to let me into, into heaven. You know, I'm a, I'm a kind person. Or they depend on their church affiliation. Ever known someone like that? <laughs> Ever been someone like that? We Baptists like to accuse the Catholics of being that way. And in all honesty, many Catholics are. You know, I, I meet this more in Brazil than I meet it here. But uh, I can't count the number of times that as I've come to a, a house and offered to, to talk with people about the Bible, to talk with people about, about Jesus, the, one of the first things I hear is, oh, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> so, Catholica. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a Catholic. You know, depending on their denom... But it's not just Catholics, I'll tell you. There's a lot of folks, depending on their denominational or church affiliation, as what's going to get them into heaven. There's Presbyterians and Methodists and Episcopalians and Baptists. Did I say that? There's Baptists? Amen, there are. <laughs> there are Baptists. Who think because their name is on the roll of a Baptist church, that somehow God's going to gather up all those church rolls and transfer them to his book of life. But he won't. Because our names are written there if we have put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. As our Lord and as our master and our savior. And if we have not done that. We, along with many, 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 Jesus said, walk on the broad road that leads to destruction. And we are one heartbeat away from it. But most people walking that road do not think that hell is their next destination. Many of them think that because of these other things, they'll go to heaven when they die. Some of them think there's a halfway house between heaven and hell, and that they'll go there and they get a second chance to sort things out. But the Bible speaks of nothing like that. And far too many, I'm afraid. Far too many who self-identify as Christians, if you ask them, that say, I'm a Christian. But they have never surrendered the control of their life to the Lord Jesus. Jesus is not their Lord. They are their own Lord. They do what they please. rather than surrendering control of their life to the Lord Jesus. My friend, if you recognize yourself here, do not leave this place this morning continuing to walk down the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus came to be that one way that you may have forgiveness of sin, that I may have my sins forgiven, that each of us individually may come to him and put our trust in him as Lord and master of our lives, believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord.
That is what he wants for each and every one of us. But we must make the choice to enter into the gate, the narrow gate, by trusting in him. Folks, the ones that I am labeling as fakes this morning are the ones who say, I'm a Christian. But they've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Master. Now Jesus addresses this in the very next part of the sermon. He says, there is one way to determine if a person is real or fake. Listen. Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Folks, this is not rocket science. <laughs> this is not tough to understand. There's nothing mysterious here. When Jesus is Lord over a person's life, he changes that life for the better. It's that simple. Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what? He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So we should use this in our own lives as a measure. Listen, no matter how sure or insecure you are in your personal salvation, use this as a measure in your life right now. Think about it. If you say you are a Christian, in what ways has Christ changed you? In what ways has he made you new? What are some of the, the old bad things uh, about your life that he has transformed into something new and good and beautiful? So let us use it in our own lives first. But, we should also use this as a test for those that we allow to become the influencers in our life. People that we will listen to. People whose opinion counts with us. People that, that at least in some way we, we think, I, I kind of want to be like them. We, we give them a place of influence in our life. So use this as, as a test of their fruit. First, look broadly at their life. Are they exhibiting godliness? Do you see the fruits of righteousness being produced in their lives? And as you follow their influence in some way, is doing that producing more righteousness and goodness in your life. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. So, so don't allow someone that precious position of being an influencer in your life, whether it's a good friend or a, a teacher or a preacher, anybody. Don't give them the place of being an influencer without examining the fruit. Therefore, by their fruits, you shall know them, says the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus says, you know, not everyone who claims to be godly is real. Verses 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Folks, the people who truly have Jesus as their Lord, are the people who in their lives do the will of God, do the will of the Father. They, they, they do what the Father says to do. Trusting Christ does not just make us more religious. You know, that's the references to casting out demons and doing wonders. Listen, there's nothing wrong with casting out demons or doing wonders in his name. Jesus, at certain points, commanded his disciples to go out and do that in his name. It's not that there's anything wrong with doing that. It's just doing that's not all there is to it. <laughs> the, the larger picture is that those who trust Jesus are not those who do the outwardly religious things. They are those who do and obey the will of the Father. That's who has Jesus as Lord. When we obey Christ, we do the will of the Father. When we obey the scriptures, we do the will of the Father. And then finally, Jesus says, there are certain things that real followers of Jesus do. Verses 24 to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Folks, people who are on the path that leads to life continually build their lives on the rock. And who's the rock? The Lord Jesus Christ. They obey and practice the word of God. And Jesus said, and they endure the storms. It's not that they don't have storms, but they endure the storms. So where are you? Where are you on the road of life? Are you on the narrow path that leads to life because you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? You have followed him. You are following him. He is your Lord and your master. You are building your life upon the solid rock of the Lord Jesus. Are you walking the broad path? Obviously, you're walking the religious side of it. You're in church today. Or you're watching church online. But we, we've talked about that. And there's a lot of people doing the religious stuff. A lot of people doing Christian kinds of stuff. But they've never trusted Jesus as their Lord. They've never surrendered control of their life. They still basically just do what they want to do. They have not entered through the narrow gate putting their trust in Jesus and inviting him to be Lord. But you can. You can. He makes the invitation to each and every one of us. And God is not willing, God does not desire that any should perish, but that each and every one of us should come to repentance. And I will tell you, as long as there is any desire in your heart, to come to Christ and trust him. It's not too late. It's not too late. You can trust him today.
Stand with me and let's pray. Every head bowed. And if you recognize today that you walk on the broad road that leads to destruction, but you don't want to. You believe the gospel. And right now you want to invite Jesus to become the Lord of your life and surrender your life to him. Then right where you stand, just in the quiet of your heart, you pray a prayer like this with me. Dear Jesus, I do believe that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. And I believe you rose from the dead. Jesus, today, I repent of my life of sin and I invite you to come and live inside of me and to be the Lord, the master, the boss of my life. Lord Jesus, I surrender control of my life. And beginning right here, right now, I will follow you. I desire to obey you. I want you to be my Lord. Now with our heads remaining bowed right now, I want to say to you that if you just prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to not wait till the end of the service, but I'm going to ask while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around, nobody's watching. I'm going to ask you to leave where you're standing and go right now over to our next steps desk, which if you're new here is to my right, it's to your left, right over against the, the exit. One of our pastors, Brother Rick, is there. Just go over right now and just quietly say to him, I just trusted Christ. He'll help you. He'll help you with what your next step as a brand new believer is. Don't, don't wait. Do that right now. And Father, even while some folks are standing and deciding what they're going to do about trusting you, Lord, I want to pray for all of us who have trusted you. That your spirit will prompt us and that we will be obedient to more carefully examine those that we allow to be influencers in our life. Lord Jesus, that we will do what you told us to do to examine the fruit of their lives and to examine what kind of fruit their influence produces in our life. So that we can know the real from the fake. We can follow the true and not the false. And thus glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us worship as we sing. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my life, my strength. just share this word we are starting some new bible studies some for men some for women we call pop-up bible studies and what that means is that the whole bible study is done in one session on one night so it's not continuous for multiple nights or multiple weeks but it's one night on one topic or one one passage uh, some of these are being done in, in homes. Some may be done on site. There is information about the new ones that are being offered out at the What's Happening desk. You know, we have, we have different desks here. We have the Welcome desk. That's over on this side. 
in the cafe. There's the what's happening desk. That's over here. And that's more for those of us that are attending here. We want to know about the events. And then there's the next steps desk over there for what's your next step in, in your journey uh, with, with Christ where we try to help. So this is at the what's happening desk. There's information and sign-ups for these pop-up Bible studies. These Bible studies do have limited enrollment. Each of them will only have a certain number of people that can, can come into that study because they're not being held in here or in Fellowship Hall or in smaller group settings. So I encourage you to go by. If you have any interest in one of those, go by and get that information and sign up for the one that you want to be a part of. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Our Lord Jesus prayed to you said, Father, sanctify them, make them holy in your word. Your word is truth. Lord, thank you for giving us a word in which we can fully depend and know that the word came from above, from on high, from you. We can believe it. We can act upon it. In Jesus' name we pray.